always and for our survival as it is today. It will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all this commandment before the Lord our God, just as he has commanded us. When your son comes to you and he says, Dad, what can you tell me about this? Can you explain these things to me? Moses says, here's what you tell him. Son, let me tell you about what God has done for us. Let me tell you about how great and awesome God is and what he has done for our family and for our people. And here's what you can say to your son when he asks you. I was a slave in sin. I was in bondage to my own carnality. I, I was enslaved to bad attitudes. I was enslaved to filthy speech. I was in, in, enslaved to alcohol and drugs and other things. I, I was in, enslaved to wickedness and sin. But Jesus Christ came and he rescued me and he changed my life forever. And because of what he has done for me, I will worship him. And I will praise his name forever. Son, that's why we do this. We do this because this is important. Because there's more to this life than just this life. And son, I want you to see that. I want you to understand that too. Solomon, in Proverbs chapter 1 through 9, just about each one of those chapters begins with the expression, my son, listen to my words. My son, hear my instruction. Solomon took time to talk with his sons about life. And in those chapters, if you look through them, Solomon talks with his sons about some pretty difficult subjects. Subjects like sex and subjects like money and, and choosing friends carefully and being wise and staying away from, from women who would be seductive and, and, and call us into traps. Solomon talks about subjects that we don't like to discuss, but Solomon sits down with his son and he says, my son, hear my instruction. We're going to talk about these things. Solomon had those teachable moments with his children. And it's in these moments where we talk about these subjects where we spend that quality and that quantity time like we talked about last week. It's in those moments that we connect with our sons in meaningful ways. It's in those moments we teach our sons how to be fathers. When we sit down with our sons and we say, son, let me tell you about this. He learns this is what fathers do. They sit down with their sons and they teach them about life and about circumstances and they answer questions and they give guidance and wisdom. Our job as parents is not only to raise our children. Our job as parents is to raise them so that they will then know how to raise their children. You see, this is a multi-generational thing here. I want to share with you a quote from a man named Dave Simmons, who is a family leadership counselor. He said, plan A for training family shepherds is the original God-designed plan that calls for on-site hands-on training in a master-apprentice relationship. It is a decentralized program with an instructor-student ratio of one to two, one to three, or one to four, and it takes anywhere from 16 to 22 years. It is the father-son training program. Fathers are supposed to equip boys to become family shepherds. The task of a father is not to raise children. It is to equip child raisers. You see what Mr. Simmons is getting at here? This is not only about raising your son and that be the end of it. It's about raising your son to know how to raise his son. And it's interesting that when you look in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and in verse 2, are you still there? Look at what Moses says. So that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God. Moses called attention to this multi-generational idea. If this process of raising sons to be child raisers, if that process ends, then a family is weakened and perhaps destroyed, and that can happen in just one generation. And so I want to teach my sons that I'm likely never going to have. But I would want to teach my sons how to lead their families, not to just tell them it's their responsibility, not just say to them, this is what you ought to do, but to show them so that they will know. Now, here's a second thing that I want to teach my sons, and that is I want to teach them to work, to plan, and to provide 
for their families. Now, when we talk about providing for our families, and especially as we talk about working in order to provide for our families, we almost uh, limit our discussion entirely to material things, providing for their material well-being. But fathers, we have to provide for them in more ways than just uh, material things. We, there are other things that we need to provide. And turn with me, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy 5 and verse 8. First Timothy 5 and verse 8, where Paul writes, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Paul says it is a husband's responsibility and a father's responsibility to provide for his own, for his household. And so along that line, I want to teach my sons how to work hard. Again, I don't want to just tell them, you need to be a hard worker. I want to show them how to be a hard worker. And I want to teach them to prepare and to provide. Teaching them this can begin when they're old enough to understand basic elements of responsibility. Little boys can't do everything, but they can do some things, like picking up the toys when they're toddlers and putting them away or maybe carrying dishes to the dishwasher or something like that. And as they get a little bit older, you can increase the responsibilities that you give them. Older boys can do most things. And I notice all of the young uh, teenage boys are saying, please stop talking now. My parents are going to expect me to do more now. Yes, they are, as they should. Older boys can do most things. So give them more challenging tasks as they grow older and as they become more and more responsible. Teach them. Teach them to handle their money responsibly. Because as our boys get older and become adults, and they go out into the working world and they start earning a paycheck, they need to know how to use that. They need to know what to do with that money and how to spend that money that they receive. And so teach them about giving back to the Lord. Teach them about saving both for the future and for emergencies, because those do happen. Talk to them about the dangers of debt. Talk to them about passages like Proverbs 22 and verse 7 that says that the borrower becomes the slave of the lender. That when you owe money to people, you become their slave. And so you want to avoid debt as much as possible. Teach them to be responsible spenders. Do you remember the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15? And in verse 13, after he, he had gone to his father and he said, give me the portion of the inheritance that belongs to me, it says that he went out and he invested wisely and he doubled his invest. No, what does it say he did? He squandered his wealth with prodigal or wasteful living. He didn't have a good grasp on how to handle his finances. He didn't have a good grasp of a budget and the idea of spending less than you make. And fathers, we need to be teaching our sons how to do that if they would be responsible regarding the money that they bring into their homes. Go with me to the Old Testament to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I want to look at this passage with you. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And I want to emphasize uh, an expression found in this verse. Ecclesiastes 9 and in verse 10. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Let me emphasize a couple of expressions in the beginning part of that verse. Whatever your hand finds to do. You know what that says, young people? Get a job. That's what it says. It says find something to do with your hands. Stay busy. Get a job, any job. Get out of the house. Your parents don't want you there anymore. I'm kidding. Partly. Find something to do. You may have some special talent, some proclivity toward some skill or another. Find a way to use that. Find a way to harness that ability that you have been given and make something with it. Do something with your hands. Whatever your hand 
finds to do. I, I think that's interesting. I don't think that the Bible says we have to exclusively be blue-collar workers, but if you find something to do with your hands, that is a wonderful blessing. That is a great thing that God has given you the ability to learn, to have that, that capacity to work with your hands. Get out in the world, find a job, start taking on that responsibility, and you will be blessed for it. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Let me tell you what that says. When you go out and you find a job, especially if it's your first job, it's going to be awful. Your first job will be terrible. Talk to your parents about their first job. I'll tell you about mine. I grew up in southern middle Tennessee, and the weather there is similar to how it is here. It gets pretty hot in the height of summer. And my first job was working at Arnold's Furniture, uh, furniture Store as a uh, delivery boy and as an assembler of furniture. I worked in a warehouse, no air conditioning, big metal building that had one tiny little fan in the very top of the ceiling, you know, to circulate the air. It had to have been 170 degrees in that building. I just know that's what it was. It was awful. I worked in there all summer. But you know what? It was good for me. And I'm still benefiting from that job because I worked all summer, I saved up my money, and I bought a nice Martin guitar that still sits in my office at home. And I still play that thing. And I think, not so fondly, but I, I think about that job, that first job that I had for those two summers when I was in high school. And I think about the fact that I was working for $6.85 an hour. And I think about the $2 tips that I got when I would make deliveries to people. Move in a 1,200 pound piece of furniture and get two bucks. Great trade, right? But I'll tell you what it was. It was beneficial for me. It was beneficial for me to learn how to get up early in the morning, get ready, go to work, take on that responsibility, earn income from that, come home with that money, give some to the Lord, do other things with that money, like saving so that I could buy something that I really wanted with it. What did it do? It taught me a number of lessons. I hated most every moment of that job, but it was good for me. I can't honestly say that I did it with all my might, but... I should have. And if I had been wiser and not so foolish, I would have done it with all my might. It seems like, and I say this with no authority whatsoever because I'm 30 years old and I didn't live back in the 1950s, but some of you did. And I've heard you say things like this. Back in my day, that kind of job would have been seen as an opportunity. And I think that's true. A long time ago, flipping burgers at McDonald's in an entry-level minimum wage position, that was seen as a way to get into the workforce, show that you can work hard, and move up in the world. And so there were a lot of people who started making french fries at Walmart, making the minimum wage, making almost nothing, and yet in just a few years, they proved themselves to be responsible to be hardworking people, and they became managers of a restaurant. And then maybe they even climbed up further into the corporate element of the restaurant. And so they saw that as an opportunity. But now we look at jobs like that and we say, oh, that's just for the riffraff. I want to tell you, that's not what your granddad thought about it. Find that job. Do that job. It will be good for you. It will teach you tremendous things. Don't be lazy. Don't be careless. Take pride in your work. Be diligent. Do your job well. And those lessons will last you a lifetime. Now, here's the final thing that I want to teach to my sons. And that is, it's okay to have a soft side to you. It's okay to do that. It's okay to have some tenderness. You know, there are some in our culture who believe that being a man is equivalent to being a barbarian and just acting like this animal with no civility. And so there's a lot of, of boys who grow up thinking that they should never show any tenderness at all. Uh, if they display any kind of tenderness, that people are going to think that they're weak and they're soft. And, and, and I don't want to be seen as a girl and so I've got to be a man, you know, and, you know, crush cans on my head and stuff like that. 
you go around crushing cans on your head, I have another word for you, and it's not manly. It's foolish. That, that's, that's the word I'm thinking. You can be tender and still be masculine. And if you're not sure if that's true, come to the stepping up class next quarter. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk specifically about how you do that. But can I just give you some examples of some people in the Bible who were tender and yet they were pretty manly dudes too? Do you remember David when he killed Goliath? What he said in 1 Samuel 17, when he went to King Saul, the leader of Israel, leader of the army, who was out there, knees knocking together, scared to death of this giant Goliath, and this young boy, David, shepherd, comes up to him and he says, I got this. Because back home, when I was with my father's sheep, one day there was this bear that came in and I killed him. Uh, and, and there was another day where there was a lion that came into the flock and, and I went right up to that lion and I grabbed him by the hair of his chin and I hit him over the head with a staff and I killed him. Wow. That's pretty incredible. Was David a man? I'd say so. And yet, if you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 18, look at the very next chapter. Right after he talks about killing the bear and killing the lion. You turn the page, you look at 1 Samuel chapter 18, and here's what he says. Verse 1. Or here's what it said about David, rather. It came about when he had finished speaking to Saul, as when David did, that the soul of Jonathan, Saul's son, was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. Verse 3, Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Look at chapter 20 and verse 17. Jonathan made David vow again because of his love for him, because he loved him as he loved his own life. Look at verse 41. David rose from the south side and fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times, and they, David and Jonathan, kissed each other and wept together, but David wept the more. Jonathan and David have this close friendship. You might even say it was an intimate friendship. And I don't mean that, of course, in any romantic or sexual way, but they had a closeness that they shared together. They were best friends and they were not afraid to embrace each other and kiss each other in that brotherly uh, brotherly love kind of way. They weren't afraid to do that. They didn't say, hey man, let's, if anybody sees us doing this, people are going to think we're girls, man. They didn't do that. They had this close friendship. David, moreover, had a heart that was incredibly tender. Look at Psalm 51. After he sins with Bathsheba, he just pours out his heart to God in Psalm 51. And, and you, I suspect the paper he wrote it on was just sopping with tears. What about the Apostle Paul? In Acts 20, in verse 31, Acts 20 and verse 31, Paul met with the elders of the church at Ephesus and he said that I was with you day and night for three years exhorting and admonishing with tears. Paul says, I was with you in my preaching and I was tearful over you. In 1 Thessalonians 2 and in verse 7, Paul wrote to the church there and he said that you know that when we were with you, we treated you as a, young, as a mother shows tenderness toward her own children. Paul showed tenderness toward the people that he was preaching to in Thessalonica and in other places. And yet you look at all the things that Paul says he endured. He was stoned and left for dead. He shipwrecked three times. He'd been beaten with rods. He was persecuted uh, to extreme ends. Would you look at Paul and say, he's a big girl? No. And yet he has this tenderness about him. Jesus, the man who went into the temple and he 
turned over the tables of the money changers and he put together a, a whip of cords and he started driving out animals and I take it he was screaming and he was letting people know this is not what you do in the house of God. That same Jesus stood at the tomb of Lazarus weeping because his friend had died. That same Jesus stood on a hill outside of Jerusalem weeping because the city would not listen to his preaching. Jesus had a tenderness about him, but Jesus was also a man in every sense of the word. And so boys, let me say to you, it's okay to cry sometimes. It's okay to be vulnerable sometimes. It's okay to show tenderness sometimes. This is the easiest point in this lesson for me to talk about. I show tenderness all the time. I think that's part of the reason God gave me three girls. It's just because I'm one of them anyways. Tenderness is not a problem for me, but I recognize it is a problem for some. But let me say to you, you have feelings. You may not want to acknowledge them. You might suppress them and act as if they're not there, but they are. It's okay to talk about them. It's okay to let them come out. Tenderness does not equal weakness. In fact, I would argue that tenderness is actually a sign of great strength. So these are just a few things that I would want to teach my sons. I want to teach them how to be the leader that his family needs. I want to teach him how to work hard and how to provide for his family, both materially, spiritually, emotionally, and otherwise. And I want to remind my sons that it's okay to show some tenderness all along. It's good and beneficial even, not just for them, but for their children and for their spouse and for others who may be in their circle. Well, there you go. What we want to teach our daughters, what we want to teach our sons, I don't think there's any other basis to cover. I hope the lessons have been helpful. They're certainly helpful to me. Maybe this morning, you're here on Mother's Day, and you came to worship this morning simply because it's Mother's Day. And you wanted to honor and show appreciation to your mother. But is that the only reason you came this morning? If it is, I will tell you, that's okay. You know, people have been blindsided by God on a number of occasions. People ha have come to the point of faith in Jesus Christ when they had no intentions of ever doing so. And so maybe you're here this morning and, and you didn't come here expecting anything to happen. You didn't come here expecting anything to touch your heart or make you consider your spiritual life and your spiritual health. But maybe something has. Maybe some scripture, maybe some song, maybe something we talked about in the sermon this morning has made you think about your life. If you're not a Christian, can I suggest to you that that's a little bit of tenderness being seen in your heart? If you're thinking about your soul's condition, you know, God can only work in ground that's fertile. God can only work in ground that is open and receptive, and it takes a tender heart to be receptive to the gospel. If you don't know Jesus, don't harden what God is trying to make tender. Listen, ask. If you have questions, talk to us. We want to answer them. We want God to answer them. If you have concerns, say something. Let's talk about that. Let's see what God is offering to you if you would become his child. If we can help you this morning, we invite you to come as we stand and sing together.